From the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. We are back. My name is John. I'm the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly podcast about consumption and a bunch of other bullshit. With me this week is the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast, and his name is Sean. Sean, how are you doing today? It's Friday. It's garbage. It's garbage garbage. day here. (laughs) It's always garbage day here. I'm doing all right. It's been a unnecessarily long week for really no good reason, but, you know, it's Friday. And, yeah, we're going to talk about a Nick Cage movie. We'll get to that later. What have you been watching this week? I have been traveling for work, so I have not watched much besides a couple episodes of The Office. I don't know if you have like a, a, well, I don't know if you have like a go-to. Which which office? uh, office? Yeah. The The, UK or the American? The US one, the Michael Scott. I don't know. Do you have like a, when you go on business or when you're like, you just got something to watch, you need to watch something, you have a show that you watch? Generally, no, because the hotels I've been put in, unfortunately, don't have any like streaming options unless i want to bring my laptop and i haven't wanted to because that's just extra questions going through security so it's been every hotel room that i've had has gotten at least comedy central so it's usually a mix of south park seinfeld which is pretty regular for me anyway i'm not a fan of the office though so whenever that's on i tend to just kind of do a lot of channel surfing i feel like i only watch it when i'm traveling (laughs) or i'm somewhere that i'm not a fan either or it's okay but i saw it Pretty much when it was first run, so I don't really feel the need to watch it again. You know, I tried really hard with that show. Like, I watched it when it was first on for, like, maybe six or seven episodes. It didn't really hit for me. And then it had its renaissance when it it was on Netflix, and, like, everyone kept talking about it. So I was like, well, I'll give this another try. And it's I got, like, a season in. Still wasn't really hitting for me. And then COVID came around, and I was like, well, I got nothing else to do. So I tried it again, and after three tries, I was like, all right, I'm 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 done. I don't care about this show. The only thing that I really watched this week was when I was home, I watched a YouTube video. It was like, I think it was a Vice thing, where this guy took acid before he went to a monster truck rally. <laughs> and so it's called like Monster Truck Rally. It's like all kinds of bad idea. On acid. Yeah, and it, it didn't look like it was very much fun. That's You know, that title <laughs> is enough that I would click on it without too or at least bookmark it for later. I'll put it in the show notes so everybody can can take a look and they can judge for themselves i fell into the show quarterback on netflix which is eight episodes i did see an episode of that so only one so far yeah just the first one so i I don't feel like this is really spoilery because it's it's not that kind of show but i will say i i'm a total like admitted junkie for that kind of television just like behind the scenes with i don't even care what the sport is if you're gonna let me watch athletes do their thing like behind the scenes i'm all for it and the difference between watching patrick mahomes and marcus Mariota is just night and day like i can see why one of these is the best quarterback in the league right now and the other one is marcus Mariota. <laughs> yeah who is it it's mahomes her cousins Mariota, Mar- marcus yeah. kirk cousins and kirk cousins like it's obviously i'm a michigan state fan so like i have a long history of watching kirk cousins and He's not my favorite quarterback by any stretch, but again, watching that show, you can see why Kirk Cousins is a, I think he's in like his 13th year now or something like that. He's a career starting quarterback in the NFL. I don't think he's going to be a guy who can like be a top 10 quarterback, but you can see why he's better than the bottom half of the league and why he's a professional NFL quarterback. And again, then there's Marcus Mariota where they spend like a whole episode like this is my chef. He was my buddy in high school and he said he was going to be a chef. So I hired him. Didn't Cousins take over for RG3 in Washington? Is that where he got got drafted the same year as RG3? RG3 went second overall and Cousins went in the fourth or fifth round, something like that, and was confused by it because they just drafted a quarterback number two overall. And then as we all know, Cousins blew his knee out and RG3. We're not Cousins. RG3 blew his knee out and cousins got starts and i think he gave it back for a little bit when rg3 came back but then he just got hurt again and they went right back to cousins and he's been in minnesota since yeah i know he got i know he got franchised by minnesota twice so that would be six years in the league because he wouldn't have had a fifth year option and so it's got to be at least five or six years that he's been there at this point are you searching it's been a while no i was doing something what i know Sorry. sorry 
It is a good show, though. I know that the NFL is saying that they're going to do more of these types of shows with Netflix because they have some kind of contract with them. And I'm all for it because it's a very well produced show. It's very well narrated outside of Hard Knocks. It's about as good as any like behind the scenes NFL show that I've watched. Peyton Manning's the narrator, right? He does like the opening, but he doesn't do the entire thing. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it kind of threw me because when they start the show, they have them all kind of talk. They do their little snippet soundbite stuff. And then Peyton Manning, you know, they show him and he starts talking. And I was like, wait a minute, is this going to be just a show about quarterbacks in general? Or how's this going to work? And then then they, they kind of drop him out and he does his little intro narration part. I know he's the producer on the show, so I kind of got the impression that they paid him... X amount of dollars to show up for a day, record a couple lines, and then he was off to do, I don't know, Papa John's commercials or whatever he does. And does he do Papa John's? I don't know. Chicken par- he, he did does. that chicken pardon commercial, which I thought was a Papa John sandwich. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. I won't argue. I, I, I don't, don't remember care. who it is. <laughs> Past that, the only other thing I really went back and watched was the movie The Cable Guy, which I'm assuming you've seen that, right? The Jim Carrey one, Judd Aptow movie. As being a former. Former cable guy. Yes, yeah. I did. Watch well, cable I wasn't going to bring that up one because point. we might get canceled for that. But if you watch that movie from the eye of like a horror movie as opposed to a comedy movie, it kind of adds a different layer to it. Yeah, I mean, he's clearly sociopathic, oh, yeah. at least at the very least to say again, very least. But yeah, that was pretty much all I really got into this week. And it kind of been a like I said a weird week, and we're kind of getting right into shit. If we go into that, you got anything you want to add before you just break into vampirism? No, I mean, I, I. I had observations on New York, but I don't know if I need to rehash those. That's where I went for, for work. You had bagels so. the size of your fist. Yeah, those things were big. You hear about New York bagels being the best bagels or whatever, and you get through your little lender's bagel, and it's maybe like two inches thick at the most. And this thing, I sent you a picture. I had my fist for scale next to this this bagel, and it was ch- almost twice as big as my hand, like my my clenched fist. It was huge, and it wasn't the only one. I'm a Thomas's bagel guy myself, but Lenders is okay. Oh, okay. I like that Lenders is in the refrigerated section. It makes you feel like they're a little bit more fresh than Thomas's, whereas Thomas, they just kind of sit See, out. See, I feel the exact opposite. I feel like because Thomas is sit, uh, sits out, they have to be fresher because they're going to go bad quicker. You don't think it has something to do with like the refrigeration keeps it fresher? N- no, I think the refrigeration implies that it could be there for a lot longer because you're slowing down the rotting process the decaying yeah. factor plus they have an everything bagel with thomas's and the best they have with lenders is the onion bagel i so i stayed basically right near times square the office that i was working out of was near times square and we're from michigan detroit's the big city here and you go out and drive through detroit and there's nobody on the street around lunchtime probably you see more people or along woodward or where the quicken sure. rocket whatever that building's called Campus marshes, there's there's pockets. People hanging out there a lot of times. Yeah, there's little pockets of activity, but it was like one of my coworkers went running, which I'm not going to do that, but he was <laughs> up at six in the morning. He said he ran. There were people on the street. He's jumping over homeless people or weaving through people. Just as many people out. I We went to dinner the first night near Times Square. I walked back about a mile to my hotel, maybe even less, but it felt like about a mile. And I walked through Times Square and it was just wall to wall people. There was stuff going on. All the lights were on and everything. It was just nuts. And it whatever. I mean, it's a microcosm, right? Like you could go if you went to places, parts of Detroit, if you went to parts of Chicago, Indianapolis, whatever larger cities are in the area. Not that Indianapolis is a massive city, but it's a yep. large, it's a big city in, in Indiana. If you just got dropped into like in Detroit, if you got dropped at Woodward near all the stadiums, you're going to say, I don't know what all these people say all this bad stuff about Detroit. It's great here. Like there's stuff going on, but you go like two or three blocks either way and it gets a little hairy depending on what time. With New York and being in that area, you go there and it's like, oh, it's so busy. There's always all these people out. There's a lot of homeless people. There's a lot of people trying to scam or they're whatever. It's hard to say because I've only been to that spot. So you make a judgment call, but I will say it smelled like pot everywhere. You could not go anywhere. I mean, that happens in Detroit too. So that's true. Yeah. Everything smells like pot pretty much. I mean, shit, depending on the day of the week, it smells like that around my house. So might be your house. Could be. But yeah, it was just and I asked other people that work there all the time. And I said, did it smell like pot all the time before it was legal here? And they're like, not as much, but it's crazy. You walk and there's just smoke shops. And it's I guess there's like a, a loophole in the city that just regular smoke shops can sell it. I found that interesting the last time I was in Chicago. Like, it's not quite that 
available that like just any shop can sell it, but you can basically smoke it anywhere. Like as long as you're not blowing it in some like eight year old's face, they don't care. So they had a thing they were talking about passing a law in New York when I was watching the news there that you could buy it at concerts like they wanted to pass something that would allow you to buy it at concerts, but you couldn't legally consume it at a concert. So it was just like, no, like nobody's going to yeah. do it. You know, you, you, you buy your joint or your pre-roll or whatever. You walk in some stadium. Nobody's going to. I might have mentioned that when I talked about going to that Misfit show, but that was the weirdest thing about that show to me is they had people straight up with like cups of pre-rolls, just like it was a hot dog offering the salad and you could smoke it right there. Seeing a comment here, uh, Everett saying fucking NY city gave me legit anxiety when I went to see Meshuggah and Slayer. Drewski, that might've been because you went to see Meshuggah and Slayer. That's not exactly a relaxing environment. It, it is hard though. When you go from a place where it's like, you're not seeing people like that all the time and you go there at first, the morning we got there, we got flew in, had to go right to the, right to our office from the airport, we left it. The flight was at seven, got off the plane about 8.39, took a cat or a Uber straight to the office, went in, left and went to the hotel. And it was, it felt like we walked 20 minutes. And the next morning when we walked back to the office, it was like two blocks. It was like, oh, well, it feels like it was five minutes. You know, it was like legit because you're carrying your luggage. And if you're not used to it, it's, it's a, it, it, it could instill a lot of anxiety right off the bat being like i mean it's funny to say like oh small town usa over here but it's a totally different oh, animal sure. when you go a place like that where it's yeah 10 times the population in a third of the area no i i get that i haven't been there in over a decade now but it is wall-to-wall people is what i remember it's like walking out of a lions game or like a sold out baseball game but that's everywhere you go yeah yeah, it's crazy. All right. I don't got anything else to add. So New York aside, let's talk about some fucking vampires, huh? Let's do it. So if you did not read the title of this episode, this week we are talking about the Nicholas Cage and Nicholas Holt movie. I guess I should have worded that the other way. Renfield, which came out this year in 2023. I've been slacking, I realized, and haven't been reading a third party review. So I'm going to get that out of the way real quick. This movie was given three and a half stars by Chris C. And I like this review because this is a very interesting comment. Solid movie if you're a Nicolas Cage fan. Like an hour and a half long. Gore and blood. Some parents left with their younger kids. That's a good review. Some parents left with their younger kids. Some parents left their younger kids there. This movie is currently number 97 out of question mark, down from number 23 on IMDb. I'm actually a little surprised, considering some of the stuff that's come out in the past couple weeks, that this was still up at 23. We don't know when they reset this counter or how, we don't know how many this is out of either, but it seems like 23, for a movie that's been out, it's been out since Evil Dead came out, so a couple months now, it seems pretty high for this to be recent to me. Yeah, and I mean, we're we're talking about this movie quite a bit after the hype cycle has i felt has already died but i think it's now streaming exclusively on peacock so maybe it's picked up a little bit more steam because of that that makes sense so this movie gets six out of four from people on imdb and there is a plot here sean do you want to read the plot yeah i'm gonna just read the real quick quick and dirty on imdb it says renfield dracula's henchman and i don't understand this inmate at the lunatic asylum for decades is that in the movie? I don't movie? remember that. Is this a, this a different movie? <laughs> Longs for a life away from the Count, his various demands, and all the bloodshed that comes with them. I mean, he lives in a hospital in the majority of this movie, but I, I don't remember any. Maybe, that you know, this got to be just some random, like, fans interpretation of what this movie is no that's the top tagline that's like the top storyline yeah i'm looking at it but i i don't remember any lunatic asylum i mean the most insane person in this movie is dracula but well i think that the the hospital that they inhabit on their arrival to new orleans is technically on the same insane asylum but i'll read you the storyline real quick in this modern mount let me start that over In this modern monster tale of Dracula's loyal servant Renfield, the tortured aide to history's most narcissistic boss, is forced to procure his master's prey and do his every bidding, no matter how debased. But now, after centuries of servitude, Renfield is ready to see if there's a life outside of the shadow of the Prince of Darkness, if he can only figure out how to end his codependency. And that's written by Universal Pictures. I think that's a better description of what this movie is, honestly. Yeah. Makes a little bit Did more you sense. have expectations on this movie ahead of time? 
I expected from what I saw in the trailers, which was plastered everywhere, they sponsored one of the UFC events that was... They were up for like two or three weeks where they had that all over the place. Yeah. I expected it to be very comedic focused. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. I thought this was going to lean pretty heavy into like, I, I and I say that it this way on purpose, like comedy horror, where it was going to be essentially a comedy movie with Dracula in it. That's exactly what I was expecting was just very, again, just straight comedy horror movie. What this movie really is, is kind of, it, it has elements of comedy and while well, it tries to, and it has el- certainly has elements of horror in it, but it's almost more like a police procedural comic book movie that happens to have Dracula and Renfield in it. It feels very much like a buddy cop film yeah, with elements of horror, with action and comedy. And I would think it's probably mo- most action, some comedy very little horror i don't think there's any real horror in this there's gore in it sort of which is a major complaint that i'll have at some point in this conversation but there's no point in this movie where anything feels creepy scary uncomfortable even when maybe this because i'm too much of a nick cage fan but even when nick cage is going very like dracula or Dracula Cage, whatever he's doing, and getting to a point of being pissed, it's not really scary. It just feels like something's about to happen, and what happens is Nick Cage goes Nick Cage. Yeah, and just to mention the cast here, we have Nicholas Holt as Renfield, Nicholas Cage as Dracula, Aquafina as Rebecca Quincy, who is the main cop that we follow in the movie. We have Ben Schwartz, who you may know as the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog. He plays Ted... It says Tedward. His name is Tedward. You probably Lobo. know him as John Raffio from Parks and Rec, more than likely. I, I prefer to say Sonic the Hedgehog. Thank okay. you very much. Well, I'm going to bitch about him, too. So That's basically the main cast of the movie. We have a few other people you may recognize. Shore Agdalashu. Ag- <laughs> Agdashu. If you like horror movies. Which I don't. Sorry. Go ahead. I just was going to say I'm not a big fan. Of if you like horror movies, you probably will recognize Jenna Cannell in this because she's the girl from the first Terrifier movie that makes it about halfway through. And... Honestly, I feel like she's horribly underused in this movie. Like, she's very, very briefly in it, but it's one of the higher cat like billings on this by IMDb standards. Do you have any opinion on Nicholas Holt, or have you seen much of him before this? I mean, Mad Max. Is he in Mad? Oh, he is in Mad Max. Okay, I forgot about that. My biggest thing I remember him from before this was The Menu that just came out last year, which he's pretty good at being a shithead I, in that. I didn't see that. You'd actually probably like that. I think I said it was too uh, highbrow of a movie for our what we do. A little too artsy. I think it's just a little too like actual good, not just like the type of good we talk about. And so, but he feels like he's kind of to me getting typecast into like British whiny characters. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I could see that definitely in this movie. Mm. He has that. That's that's pretty much what he does the whole the whole movie. This really is his movie, though, to carry. And I got to say, like, it's interesting how they again, the movie's called Renfield. So you shouldn't expect Dracula to be the main character. But I noticed all the a lot of the marketing around this is really Nick Cage heavy, which as it should be, because if Nick Cage isn't in this movie, I don't know if you, I can make it through this movie. It did really feature a lot of Nick Cage in the marketing. And you would think from those trailers, from all that marketing stuff, that he's going to be like a real main component of this movie. But I feel like all the articles and things that were written leading up to the movie really kind of made it feel like he was going to be more of a character rather than... I mean, the big deal was Nick Cage plays Dracula. And I feel like the, the trailers played that up, but you almost had to read between the lines to see that he was the hook that was supposed to bring people in. And he wasn't actually going to be that big of a character. but it's kind of shady that the that the all the trailer stuff would make you think that he's a huge part. Well, and I'm I guess I'm going to cut to the chase and we'll circle around and talk about other stuff with it, but he's the reason to watch this movie. Like he is at least in my opinion, not only the most but the really only interesting part of this entire film. And you know, he he does Nick Cage things, but he does it, it under the guise of Dracula. Even the opening scene in this where they essentially reshoot the Bela Lugosi Dracula is one of my favorite parts of the entire movie. And they were just redo several scenes with Nick Cage in place of Bela Lugosi. And it looks fantastic. Like it it is something you can see that I don't know, 15 seconds that they put in the movie and say, I want a shot for shot remake of that. 
with Nick Cage. Like I would pay to see that right now without too much argument. I'd agree. That was super impressive to see that. And it was cool that they, like you said, they filmed it just like it could be spliced in with that original footage. And you wouldn't really have known the difference other than knowing Nick Cage and and Nicholas Holt are obviously not in the original movie, but it, it, they even did that that famous like iconic scene where they do that lighting across Bela Lugosi's eyes, and, and they, they do, do the it with stairway scene with the giant spider web, and yeah, and and they do that actually with Nick Cage being Dracula. They do that eye effect, not so much black and white, but they do that a few times. There was one thing I I can I feel like there's a reason now that Nicholas Cage tries to have a beard. In a lot of these movies, because his face, like the, I don't know if it was an effect or just that he's all jowly and old now, but they gave this real, like, weird, like, my beard is cut into the same kind of shape that Nicolas Cage's face actually is, it feels like. Your beard has more body than Nicolas Cage's face. He reminded me, you know, when Roger Ebert had that jaw cancer and they, like, basically removed his bottom yeah. jaw and it was just like that flap. Is, that's what his lip and lower face to me reminded me of. Just this puckering look to him. It was just a weird, it looked really weird. I wonder if, I don't know how much or if, because I, I can't think of a movie that Nick Cage is in without a beard other than this recently, but he actually had his teeth filed down to make the prosthetics for the Dracula things fit in his mouth for this movie, which one, fucking A, Nick Cage, like, do, do you, man. Two, the fact that he did that for a movie that he's not the lead in is also equally impressive. Do you, you have proof? I is saw there, can you... like several different articles that pulled it up. If you Google Nick Cage's and Nick Cage teeth and Renfield, there's like four different articles that pop up like right away. Why is the why is the gum to tooth ratio so massive? Like why does he why is he so gummy know. if he had his if he had his teeth supposedly fun. i don't believe Here, it. i don't i don't buy it it's from the effects people it was an interview with the effects people and I'll, I'll send you the link we can put it in the the notes for this but what i don't understand about him doing that although if let's just say for the sake of argument that it's true it's nick cage and it's amazing what i just don't believe it okay why would that be the one thing that we choose to go practical effects effects on and basically this entire movie i i just i just i can't get over the, the i just he's so gummy like you see his gums the entire movie he speaks generally pretty well except that sure. it, he he has the sharp teeth in his mouth so i can understand he has a little bit of a a lispy kind of essy speech thing going on but i don't know i just feel like yeah like you said why would they why would this be the thing that the hill he's gonna die on for this movie so this is in the New York Post, the headline. Oh, totally credible newspaper, the New York Post. Okay, fine. I'll find a different one with the same fucking article. Would you prefer People well, if it's Magazine? it's the same article, that's not, there's not, there's no proof there. Would you prefer you People some, Magazine? Some, some, you got to cite some fact. Oh, okay. People Magazine. Newsweek? Now that you have people in there. How about Forbes? 100% behind it. Forbes? I don't know why Forbes is covering this. Nicholas Cage really sunk his teeth into Dracula. Forbes. Blah, blah, blah. Nicholas All Cage right. shaved down his teeth to play Dracula. Slash, slash. It, anyway. Yeah. Why is that the like one effect that you chose to go practical on where you can't do anything else practical in this entire fucking movie? So what else did we like in this movie? Did you like other things in this movie other than the intro? <laughs> Was there anything other than the intro that you enjoyed about this movie? I thought I actually thought a lot of the action scenes while being matrixy and kind of wire kung fu mm -hmm. feeling were really well done. I mean, this this movie has so many action pieces that move it along. I, I, I like the action scenes. I thought that the scene inside that club when when they're trying to track down a killer. No spoilers on, on that little that little piece. Aquafina. The, the gunplay and everything, I, I, you know, she can't miss anything, but she can only miss when it like is the important characters, like all the side characters that are, have their faces covered. You can't see get like plugged away and can't miss a shot. No reloading, any of that stuff. But when it's like Ben Schwartz, who is the main villain other than Dracula, when it comes to shooting towards him, he can't like they can't hit him for some reason. But no, I really like the action. I thought that that without the action, I don't know what they would have done inside this movie i hated the action sequences in this movie really i found them to be uninspired and repetitive it felt like just another comic book or matrix movie which as i'm saying this and as i wrote this in my notes too that it's uninspired that it was boring and it just felt really formulaic but i also was like yeah but how do i like fighting when fucking steven seagal's fat ass does it against like a chair or something i don't know but 
I found him just to feel really forced. It seemed unbelievable to me that Nicholas Holt is doing like Kung Fu and all this wiry type ninja shit through the entire fucking movie. I never really like whenever they go into one of these action sequences, it's the same thing that I've seen or that we've seen a billion times. And I'm saying in comic book movies a lot because that's the way it felt to me is it's the same chore- choreography as like a Captain America movie or, you know, pick your favorite hero, whichever one goes and wrestles, you know, the big troll monster. It's essentially the same dance that they do. There's just a lot of blood splatter that comes out of it. And now that I'm on it, I'll just go ahead and say it since I've been dancing around it. How come every time blood splatters in the direction of the character that is making the blood splatter, it never sticks on the character? Like, there's a scene where Aquafina literally shoots a guy in the stomach, maybe six inches away from her. You watch blood splatter directly behind her, so it's the blood is coming towards her, as it should, and it's CGI blood, which looks bad enough as it is, but, you know, it's what it is. So the blood comes at her, and then they cut to the next scene, maybe a second later, as the body is still falling down from where she shot it. She's clean. No blood on her. No blood around her. Nothing. Just done. I want to add on to that, but I want to come back around afterwards to the the, the Nicholas Holt action-y, I don't believe he can do this kind of point that you made. I noticed in this movie, and it was throughout the entire thing, I, I actually thought the digital blood looked pretty good for it being digital blood, for it being, I mean, it looked better than Winnie the Pooh. It looked better than, <laughs> which isn't saying much, but I thought it looked better than Cocaine cocaine Bear. The one thing, the scene where they're in the, like the apartment complex, and there's that open courtyard and all the cars, and he, the guy that gets shot in the stomach. Same scene I was talking about. And he like stomps the guy like on the car. Yeah. The thing that I noticed was that the blood showed up obviously afterwards because they had to apply it to their, their costuming if they, if they showed it at all, but blood was spraying everywhere from the characters. Like he's ripping people's arms off, blood's flying all over the place and blood never gets on the walls. It never sticks anywhere. Like it just kind of, it it obviously flies up because it's just an effect, but it never goes anywhere. It just kind of disappears or whatever. Like within the next scene, it's gone. I do, to wrap back around, I feel like Renfield, who is played by Nicholas Holt, Nicholas Holt, has the power, has a small percentage of the power that Dracula has. So I can totally believe that he's doing all all this wire foo and he's flying around. He's able to like dive and jump all these long distances. He can punch people's heads off. Okay, whatever. I believe all that stuff. With all that wire foo, this movie, the action scenes in this movie are a bit, excuse me, are a better matrix matrix resurrections than matrix resurrections was like it has all the matrix effects except for bullet time stuff like that this would have been such a better like all the effects in this were so much better than the new matrix movie it's i feel like the matrix is like a benchmark that we put all these things up to but it's so old that nowadays it means nothing like we've we've moved on from that i would agree with that that statement that was better than matrix whatever the last one was. There's actually a point in this one where you find out that John Raffio is now a familiar and basically all of these, what are the Lobos or whatever they're calling them? Yeah. The crime family. They're basically all familiars for Dracula in this. And there's a scene in the second Matrix movie. Again, I, I can never remember what the R words are that they put on each one of the sequels, but the second one where Neo's in like a big he's at the bottom of like two big stairways and you see the vampires and the werewolves and whatever the uh they all jump the Frankensteins. off Frankensteins. yeah all of them the whole universal crew they all jump off of the different staircase and it's like one of the bigger choreographed scenes i think it's right around the same time as the big car chase scene in that movie the actual choreography and fight scene it almost feels like one for one identical to that scene from the second Matrix movie, except you're adding ludicrous amounts of blood that are spraying up and then disappearing. I think the one thing the Matrix movies didn't do that this movie does is all the blood. I think that's like the one, I don't remember, I mean, they're all programs, right? So they would explain not having I remember blood, a but... little bit of, well, I don't remember it on the programs, but I remember Neo bleeding a couple times. I want to say Trinity did too, but yeah, I don't think any of the, the bad guys had any blood, or yeah, at least agreed. not but anyways, excessive blood. Yeah. Tangent. That's done. the Matrix. Yeah, we already talked about the fourth one. I hate John Raffio in this movie, Ben Schwartz. I fucking hate him. I, I hate him in pretty much every show, including Parks and Rec. And I really but what wish about he Sonic was... the Hedgehog? I haven't seen Sonic the Hedgehog. You should. 
I didn't like the games. I don't have kids. Do I really need to? Yeah. I like Jim Carrey. Well, there you go. There's your selling point. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I hate Ben Schwartz. And this movie does absolutely nothing to make me like him. In fact, it only makes me hate him more. Well, I think that's fine, though, because he's a hateable character in this movie. I mean, he he acts like a tough guy. He gets confronted and he pretty much admits like he's like the figurehead. He's a pussy ass, like rich boy who gets arrested and gets bailed out by his mom. And calls his mom every time he gets in shit. I didn't realize this movie would have so much social commentary. I wouldn't call it that. I think he just sucks. I think the movie did its job. You're you're actively angry about Ben Schwartz. I am active. Well, and I'm all right with that. I'm I'm often actively angry about Ben Schwartz. So, what else did you like about this movie? Um, hmm. Before we go on, like a Nick Cage love affair. Yeah, I mean, I thought that the the effects, the the Dracula effects at the beginning of the movie. There's a scene where he gets burnt up by getting in the sunlight, and I didn't understand how far back that had happened because it, when we rejoin him in current time, he is all. He looks pretty just burnt up, decayed. Yeah, he looks and but the effect looks amazing. And I, I yeah. can't couldn't tell if it was practical, which I think it probably was or digital, but it looked great. Like I thought the the smoke effects when he would transform from being Dracula to smoke or to the bats or to whatever he would turn into looked great. I thought overall, other than the digital blood, I thought the effects, I would say 90 percent of the effects other than the digital blood, which I can't even think of what other ones there were besides the makeup and these transformation effects looked great. I thought it was a real showpiece for that. I had questions about the time, like the timeline between when we see Dracula get all burned up and when we get to modern day New Orleans, too, because with how like decayed he is in that when they first show him after that, it kind of implies that it hasn't been all that long because once he starts like beating on people in this movie, he starts looking pretty good. Like he is like Conair Nick Cage. Well, maybe not Conair because his hair's not long. He's like the rock Nick Cage in a matter of like 10 minutes. I also liked a lot of the, I thought it was legit pretty funny. There were a lot of funny parts. I liked the reoccurring ska joke that kept going on, which I thought that you might actually dig that. I dig more that they said by name a couple like a local band from here uh, <laughs> in Mustard Plug. Like I, I'm, I'm yeah. a fan of them, have been forever. They said by name Voodoo Glow Skulls, which is not a local band, but a band that I've been a fan of for a long time. I was fine with that. Like, I didn't mind the ska jokes at all. In fact, I think it's kind of funny that they made that specific of a ska joke or jokes in the movie, and it felt kind of right in the movie. Like, I, I had no problem with that at all. The, f- the first couple bad guys are ska aficionados. They go up to the to the the building, the warehouse or whatever, and they're like, is that a threat or whatever that was yeah. spray painted on the wall? And they're like, no, I think those that's lyrics to a ska song. <laughs> no, I'm not sure if it is or not, but I, I did feel a little targeted. I was like, wow, this directly like going at, at the ska references. OK, so do we got anything else we want to go on before I just go on about how much I love Nick Cage in this movie? Why don't you just yeah, why don't you tell me about your your love of Nick Cage? So this movie for me is it's saving grace is 100 percent Nick Cage. The costuming on Nick Cage, his mannerisms, the points where he kind of loses it and goes full on like coke addict Nick Cage or a little bit of like raising Arizona Nick Cage. His just wonderful ability to kind of hold back just enough and be just fucking crazy enough. It's just chef's kiss. This is what I want. I want a I, I'm sure I'm not the only person to say this. I got to think everyone who's seen this movie has said the same thing. I want a full Nick Cage Dracula movie. I, don't, I want several of them. I don't think we're going to get it because this movie didn't do very well, but I would love to see Nick Cage reprise this character multiple times for a franchise. And again, I don't think we're going to get it. Watching him in that little studio apartment get confused by these affirmations and whatnot from Renfield is just utterly comic comic gold side note from that the paint job that renfield gave his apartment is pretty funny it looks very barbie-esque which i'm I'm assuming was on purpose yeah to me this movie there's a lot of stuff i didn't like about this movie and frankly there's a lot of stuff that kind of pulled me out of it the comedy doesn't land for me i don't find with the exception of the sky jokes i don't find the majority of the things very funny I don't really give a shit about the police story or really any of the time that Nicolas Cage isn't on screen. I have a hard time really caring about anything that's going on. But when Nick Cage is on screen, I'm 100% invested and I'm enjoying myself at those parts of the movie. I got to say this. If you don't laugh at the line when the cops are going into the club and the cop says, can you order me a number three? The toilet just ordered me a number two. You're dead inside. Like there is something I'm wrong dead with you. inside. You are. I'm clearly. 
clearly did. That's what happens when you listen to Scott. You, you don't like to laugh. You don't enjoy the finer things in life. A good toilet joke goes a long way with me. I thought the comedy was all right. I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was actually, I don't know if I, I wouldn't label the movie a comedy. And if you don't like Aquafina, which I think she probably, there's a lot of people that are not on the fence of, I don't know, on the side of the fence, I guess, of liking Aquafina, because I generally don't. She just plays the same character. In every movie, she has that same affectation, like the New York City affectation, I feel like, in every movie. What else is she in? Because I she didn't really do anything for me in this, like, to make me feel like I need to seek her out. But is she in, well, I guess I, I'm looking right at it. I can pull it up. There's nothing about her that really stands out. I didn't see Ocean's 8. I didn't see Crazy Rich Asians. I didn't see The Little Mermaid or The Farewell. These are top four movies that are on her IMDb. I mean, you can't you can't say I don't know. You can't say you, you like her or didn't if you haven't seen any of those movies. But that's fair. I mean, she did a lot of voice work. Just her care. I've seen her and stuff. I have not been impressed. I don't hate her. Oh, yeah. I don't hate her. I just I wouldn't go as far to say that I'm a fan of hers, obviously. No. And I would think that if you are not a fan of hers, you will not like this movie because she is featured very heavily in it. I would say this movie doesn't change your mind. I think. I, I honestly think there's two people that are, two types of people that are going to genuinely like this movie because I don't think the story that they go for really does enough to drive this movie like above its actors. I think it's going to be the actors that save it. And those two actors are really Nicholas Cage or Nicholas Holt. I, I don't have a problem with what the character of Renfield in this movie. I think he's fine. I don't think he's written particularly well. There's moments where he's a little obnoxious to me, but I can see why a lot of people can and would like him. Or the obvious is Nicolas Cage, who is in it just enough to make this movie enjoyable. I had a burp. <laughs> I like how you did it, then clarified it. So, yeah, yeah. there was that moment of sil awkward silence there that I just can't live with. That's fine. So, am I wrong on that, though? Like, honestly, I think the two lead, well, is Nicolas Cage the lead? I don't know. The the two male leads, I think, are what carry this movie based off the strength of them being good actors. And the rest of the movie is just kind of along for the ride. It's not a super strong story or super strong mm -hmm. script. Definitely held together by those two guys. Nicolas Cage. I mean, why were people going to see this movie? It was all the hype around. It was and not that Cage many people did actually go see it. Yeah. Sounds like. But it was the hype that Nicolas Cage was playing Dracula. And he goes in when they first showed pictures of him in public without the beard i was so happy about that <laughs> it was it was a bit of a shock because again we hadn't seen him without some kind of facial hair in a long time and it was probably one of the more anticipated movies of his career in recent times you know we had like all the we had all that string of the 20 or however many movies like that he was doing to pay off tax debts or whatever it was that were just whatever movies he was make he could make money from right so this was He's finally starting to come back up on on a bit of a incline, a bit of a coming back, his comeback or whatever, the, his fifth comeback. I think that's people got hyped up about it. If, if it weren't for those two guys, though, Nicholas Cage and, and Nicholas Holt, I don't think many people would have given a rip about this movie at all. I think this is only the second vampire movie that we've talked about on this show. Are as a, in general, do you gravitate towards vampire movies? Or you kind of shy away from them. I don't really. It's really neither. Like, I don't. There are some vampire movies that I like. Like, I really like Lost Boys. Sure. I really like From Dust Till Dawn. And I think there's maybe two or three more I could count on one hand that I really like that are straight vampire movies. I don't hate them, but I don't go seek them out generally unless I hear really good things about them. For me, with this movie, like I try I try to go into every movie with as low as expectations as possible because it's harder to be disappointed when you don't expect yeah, anything. Works out that way a little bit better. Right. right. It's also why I try to avoid trailers and I being a UFC fan like you are, I, I really couldn't avoid trailers on this. Like like you said, it was plastered all over the place. But I didn't really have high expectations for this to be like a uh, a modern take on like Dracula's story. Because I don't really feel like it is. I feel like this is more of a modern take on like dealing with abusive relationships and Dracula happens to be there. But seeing those pictures that you mentioned of Nick Cage when he was in the purple suit and he was all ghostly pale and white i got excited more so because it was like oh it looks like they're paying attention to what dracula should look like to what this kind of content should be and i didn't get into the mindset of like i think this is going to be nick cage chewing scenery and being you know dracula god 
part three or whatever. But I still feel like somehow, even as great as he was in this, I, I just felt let down by this movie. And to bring up, pull back the curtain a little bit, we had talked about watching this and, and talking about it months ago. Oh, yeah. Like when it came out, because we were expecting that there was going to be a lot of talk about it. And it just kind of fell through the cracks because we had other stuff going on. But it I didn't, mean, I, I it do didn't help remember that Evil Dead came out like two weeks after this and pretty much killed all the, any momentum that it might have had. But I do think that when it was announced or when we knew it was coming somewhere to streaming that you could watch it, we were both pretty into into talking about it. It just, like I said, just kind of fell through the cracks. But yeah, it is hard to, with all the, the marketing really did turn me off personally. I was a little less into seeing it just because it was talked about so much. It's almost like, and not to say, I don't think this is a bad movie by any means, but I feel like when a movie is pushed that hard, there is something, it feels like there's something wrong. You know, if it's being pushed that hard, there's something that they're trying to do to make you want to go see it because it's not going to stand on its own merit. That's just how I think. If you think about when this came out too, which if I remember right, right was right in early April, you're kind of getting ahead of all the big summer movies. It's almost like a little lull there. Like you're trying to just catch whatever spark you can. I don't know. If this movie came out now, I like between Barbie and Oppenheimer, there's no way that people would give a shit about this movie. No, I, this so. would die on the vine. More so. With the stuff that's out now. So, yeah, anything you want to add or do we want to kind of break into hot dogs with this and do our question of the week? Yeah, let's just get into that because I feel like there's not really much else we can we can really dissect about this movie without getting super just into the weeds about nothing. Well, that's half the problem is there's not enough to dissect with it. So, yeah. All right. I'll go ahead and lead us off this time. I don't know who did last time, but what the hell? This movie for me is a solid five hot, like five cgi bloods topped hot dogs out of 10 truthfully this movie for me is saved by nicholas cage i think i've said that like 20 times now in this episode it is his mannerisms hit even when we get to the climax of the movie or the the third act where they're dealing with the issue of dracula like just the way his mannerisms are and the way he portrays this character that alone is worth the price of admission for me even if he's only in maybe a quarter of the movie screen time wise, that's probably about right quarter to a third, somewhere in that area. He's so, I mean, he is Nick Cage as Dracula and he nails it. Nicholas Holt is fine. He doesn't, for me personally, do anything that puts him over the top in this, but he's not bad either. The story's lackluster. The effects piss me off and the action sequences are just the same thing that I've seen a million times in 50 other movies over the past couple of years. So if you're going to watch it, this is the perfect candidate for a movie to say, go stream this. Don't go out of your way to pay a whole lot of money to watch it. Just stream it, watch it once, enjoy Nick Cage, and then eat some popcorn and move on with your afternoon. Sorry. I feel like I, I, I like this movie considerably more than you did. Not it to say like that's going <laughs> to, yeah, not going to say that's going to give it like a 10 out of 10 or anything, but if it, it follows the buddy cop formula, it, it marketed itself. Like we had talked early more of, as more of a horror comedy. I didn't realize that this was going to be an action film at all. I thought it was going to be horror comedy just because that's how it was marketed. I feel like it checks boxes for those for, the, for more of the action crowd than any other thing. But I, I thought the comedy was serviceable. It clearly doesn't take itself too seriously. They, they play that whole codependency angle throughout the whole movie. Different. A lot of the major plot point of this movie is the codependency between Renfield, Dracula, the support group, the, their abusers, I guess. Nick Cage plays a convincing Dracula, if not looking a little jowly most of the time. I think because all those those different kind of, I don't know, elements of the movie, it can it can span a few different fan bases. I would say, again, if you're not an Aquafina fan, you're probably not going to watch this movie, want to watch this movie. But I would give it six and a half arm javelins out of 11 hot dogs. I thought that I wasn't really put off by the digital blood. I mean, I really you, you can tell that's what it is right off the bat. But it wasn't anything that really like turned me away. The only minor nitpick that I have about it is the thing that we brought up where blood splatters everywhere, but it's nowhere at the same time. It's like it just sinks into the ground or it, it gets sucked into whatever it hits. It never really makes an impact either way. And it's everywhere. Like there are scenes where there's just buckets just gallons and torrents of blood just flying all over the place and it, it never goes anywhere it's just gone i forgot to mention that i do really enjoy that nick cage dracula gets irrationally pissed off when he sees the crest of a church on a book i thought that was pretty great hates the church 
as one should. All right. Question of the week. So we had a pretty simple question of the week. It goes along with the theme of this episode, which is Renfield slash Dracula. Our question was very simply, who is your favorite Dracula? So I'm going to start on Instagram because that's where we got the most, or not Instagram, Twitter. We'll do Instagram in a second, where we got the most feedback on this. I'm going to go through them kind of quick because we, apparently when we ask a direct question like involving Dracula or Tom Atkins, that's when people want to respond. So first off, we have a response from Taproom Tabby, who is with the Grey's Taproom podcast, which I will be a guest on next week talking about a creepy movie. So check them out. If you're not already, follow them on all the social medias and follow their podcast. But she simply included a gif of Bela Lugosi, and there's really no way you can be wrong with that answer. It's about as classic as you get. Scrolling through, bottom left of the midden, who runs a Food blog and is on Twitter said Nicholas Cage. I'm partial though because he's one of my favorite actors and he can do no wrong. I'm I'm not arguing that. Our friends over at Listen to Their Screams podcast also said Bella Lugosi. Let's see, Movies for Days, another amazing podcast that you can follow on Twitter. So toss up between Klaus and Leslie Nielsen, two separate wonderful vampires. Molly X Macabre said. If it's not Chris Lee, it's absolutely Gary Oldman. She's got another great account that's worth following on Twitter for sure. Cinema Trip Reviews said the great Sir Christopher Lee. I really do enjoy his portrayal of Dracula, especially I think it's Dracula 1972, maybe it's 73, where he's running around England killing hippies. That's a pretty good one. I mean, hippie vampires, right? Nicole at Nicole Vampire X also said Bella Lugosi. And then the Well Adjusted Horror Podcast said, it's definitely my old man. I'm assuming this is Gary Oldman. It's hard to tell in this gif. And then we have one more that is on Twitter, which is from our friend Podcast in the Woods from Boomer, who will be our guest on our next episode featuring the movie Intruder. He says, it's got to be Nick Cage as Dracula. The most fun version has yet the most fun version. And yet he still manages to be so charismatic as well, probably because he's Nick Cage, which is a good, good response to switching over to Instagram. So we had in the chat, we have average Drewski. You can follow his YouTube channel, which is at average Drewski. He said, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which it but followed closely by a movie that I have the feeling we're going to have to talk about in an episode because I read the cast, on, like the character list on this, include characters like Hooker and Mayonnaise Man. It's a movie called A Polish Vampire in Burbank. Yeah. Is that is that Bram Stoker? Bram Stoker was his first choice, but A Polish Vampire in Burbank is the second choice, which is not I think his name Bram is Stoker. Bram Stoker. No. <laughs> No, that's a different vampire. Our friend BP over at Let's Talk Horror, Horror said, the first thing that comes to mind is Duncan Regier as Dracula from the Monster Squad. He's badass. Absolutely agree with that. He calls a child a bitch in that movie, so it's hard to argue that. Then, more so than my answer, my favorite answer, Jordana over at Pretty Killer Podcast. She gave three responses, but her last one is the best. She had Bella Lugosi and Adam Sandler, both good answers, but the best answer she gave is Jason Siegel. She's referring to the end scene in the movie Forgetting Sarah Marshall, where he plays the Dracula musical, which is easily the best thing under the Judd Apto umbrella is the Dracula musical. So I'm going to take a break from talking for 20 seconds. Sean, what is your favorite Dracula? I'm a little insulted. You think my answer is only going to be 20 seconds long. Are we talking like Dracula, the character, or just vampires? The question was Dracula, but I, I whatever you want to talk about. Well, I got... I'll. I'll First will be my favorite vampire. My fa- favorite vampire is Colin Robinson from What We Do in the Shadows. Are you familiar with Colin Robinson? I'm familiar with the show, but I haven't watched it. So it's on my never ending, my never ending to watch list. He's an energy vampire and he gets his strength from boring people, which I think is an awesome, <laughs> an awesome vampire. How many power seasons to have. is that show? Oh, I think it's like four or five. Maybe I'll start powering through that and we can do an episode about that because that will make me watch it. It's on Hulu. Yeah. And technically not Dracula, but Nosferatu from Nosferatu, played by Max Schreck in 1922, would be my my pick. That seeing that character the first time and several times after that, it's such a creepy like get up costume, makeup, whatever it is, is it's just the it's it gives me the creeps like not so much now, but as a younger person that that would freak me out quite a bit. Uh, If I had to go just straight up Dracula, Dracula, it would definitely be Bela Lugosi. So my favorite Dracula is very 
without without a real challenger, Nick Cage would be the closest challenger, but it is Leslie Nielsen in Dracula Den loving it. I thoroughly enjoy the humor of, of Mel Brooks, and I think the Dracula Den loving it spoof movie is one of his most underrated movies. And I really don't care about the rest of the movie. Why, why do? Because I like the entire movie. It's also a movie with a pretty good Renfield in it. But I enjoy more than anything when Dracula comes out in the sun because he's having a daymare. And he proclaims to Renfield, Renfield, I'm fine. I'm eat, drinking wine and eating chicken. And I think that's great. So that he burns himself. I don't know. I couldn't get Leslie Nielsen after a while. As he got like really old and senile, I he I couldn't looked the same for like guy. fifty years. Yeah, no, he didn't look any different, but maybe mentally feeble is more appropriate. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. I don't know. I enjoyed that movie. Maybe it's a nostalgia thing. Probably. I don't care. I liked it. So, <laughs> anything you want to hit on before we start wrapping on this one? No, I just wanted to say if you want your answers answered, if you want your answers read on the podcast, do that. Answer the question of the week. We'll read it unless it's really long or you give your top 50 favorite things because you can't have 50 favorites. Sorry. We still read those answers sometimes. It happens. Yeah. We just laugh at you and we don't put it in the podcast. That's true. So if you want to answer some of those questions, you can answer those questions on Twitter where I'm currently seeing a picture of Darcy Prince's boobs flash across the screen. So that's interesting. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram, threads, Facebook. TikTok, which I don't usually post the question there. Pretty much wherever there is social media, if we're on it, it is at Dewey Pod Monster. We try to ca- cast a pretty wide net because some of these questions we don't get a lot of answers on. So help us get more interactive with you by following us on social media and all that good stuff. You can also follow us at crap.town. We don't usually put the question of the week on there, but all our previous episodes are on there, like our other vampire episode for Near Dark. I don't think we have another vampire other than that. If I'm, unless I'm forgetting it, maybe, maybe not. Eh. Let us know. Let us know in the comments of this episode if we did other vampire episode than this in Near Dark, and then go follow Sean wherever Sean wants you to follow him. We're thinking of doing some some live watch casts, so if anybody's interested in that, leave us comments. Let us know if that's something you'd be interested in. We've kind of been working on it in the background. But other than that, if you want to follow the crap that I do, you can check me out at youtube.drafttherapy.com. At one time in my life, I was reviewing a lot of beers. We were talking about Michigan beer. We were talking Michigan breweries and some of those people don't want to talk to us anymore. So (laughs) you can watch all the old shit at youtube.drafttherapy.com. You can also find me on all the social media networks at draft therapy and maybe I'll answer answer some of the stuff that you ask me there. I don't know. Maybe we're going to start drinking beer and doing stuff with that again at some point here. We just need to find time to be able to do it. Behind we the need curtain. people to answer us when we email them. Yeah. Behind the curtain, this has been a pretty chaotic week up for both of us. So we're, we're getting there. But anyway, bitch, bitch, bitch. That's all we do. So is that all we got? Yeah, that's all I got. Well, let's get out of here. That's it. Yeah. That's all I got. Bam.